Bharti. So welcome to the second session. Uh, so we have four talks in the session and the first talk is by Alex Gittens. He'll talk about sketching techniques for practical 1030 compositions. So I'll give you a five minute warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about some work that I did with one of my students and a colleague at RPI. As you can see, the title is slightly changed because uh, what I wanted to talk about wasn't working out. Okay, so our basic task is the same as everyone was looking at. We have some huge tensor. In this case, we're gonna do a uh, three mode tensor or order three tensor. Uh, our goal is to quickly find an accurate low rank approximation to X. It could be CPD, it could be Tucker. Doesn't really make much of a difference here. We're gonna go with CPD. Uh, this has a lot of uses and it can be posed as a numerical multilinear algebra problem. Uh, so, as we saw in a lot of talks, we can use sketching to speed up the solves involved in using an ALS, gauss sedel type approach to finding this decomposition. Uh, so the question is, how can we use sketching effectively? So we saw a lot of good uh, sort of options for sketching so that we can approximately solve the linear systems. But now we want to solve these linear systems as part of an approximation algorithm or sorry, an optimization algorithm. So the question is, how can we incorporate them accurately or solve them accurately enough, solve each subproblem accurately enough to ensure that this optimization algorithm will converge to a critical point of our objective? Okay, and part of that is, of course, we shouldn't use fixed sketching sizes. We should adjust our sketching sizes. So how can we do that practically? So those are the two uh, issues we're gonna address today. So as I mentioned, the classical sort of iterative algorithm for finding CP decompositions is a gauss sedel coordinate descent algorithm, ALS. So we fix our factors B and C, and then we update A by solving a linear system. Likewise, we update B and C in the same way. And the nice thing about ALS is that we get a sequence of low rank approximations whose approximation error is non-increasing by construction. And then under reasonable conditions, you can show that they converge to a stationary point of our objective. Okay, and of course, by reshaping these tensors into matrices, uh, we get the algorithm as a sequence of least square solves. So our goal is to solve these systems faster in a way that will still give us a good low rank approximation. Okay, uh, so if you look at the size or the shape of these systems that you get. Here we're just looking at the system you get when you're solving for A. Uh, since we assume R is very small uh, compared to the dimensions of the problem, every row of our factor matrix is over constrained. There's only R degrees of freedom here, but we have JK equations that they have to satisfy. And the same is true for the subproblems defining B and C because of our assumption on R here. So naturally, we think of sketching. Since they're over constrained, we should be able to sample the constraints to reduce the size of the problem. We could either sample them or mix and then sample. Either is fine. Uh, the runtime of this is going to decrease because we're solving a much smaller system. And the accuracy, as we saw from people talking about sketching earlier, shouldn't be too effective. So prior work has considered sketch CPD algorithms. Uh, so just as two sort of long ago examples, but sort of uh, canonical examples, um, we have some work from the scientific computation community and they used, I think essentially like a tensor sketch. And then from more of the TCS ML community, um, we see that they use leverage scores to solve these uh, systems or sketch these systems. Okay, so the issue is that these sketch CPD algorithms and pretty much all of the iterative CPD algorithms that came after that use sketching provide guarantees on each individual least squares problem over the course of your optimization. It says that when I solve the system to update A, the resulting A gives me an approximation error that's only slightly worse than the optimal approximation error. 
So the issue with this is that, you know, sort of one of the nice things about ALS is that the error is non-increasing and that helps to, you know, it's kind of, you would expect that if you want conversions. Here, potentially the error could be increasing at every iteration and then you wouldn't expect conversions, okay? Uh, and this is connected to the issue of choosing your sketching rate. So these algorithms uh, generally suggest using a fixed sketching rate or they give you a heuristic for selecting a fixed sketching rate. And hyperparameter selection isn't sort of addressed as the first order problem, okay? Uh, so as you can expect, just think of with SGD, right? If you're using a noisy estimate of your gradient, you need to decrease your step size so that you can converge. So the same thing is going on with, with sketching. We're noisily solving linear systems, so we need to sort of increase the accuracy with which we solve them. Uh, okay, and then another issue is that, as we saw in one of the talks this morning, swamping can be caused by ill-conditioned linear systems that come up in the process of getting these low rank decompositions. Okay, so we're gonna look at each of these issues. So here's an example of swamping. Looks exactly like what we saw this morning. Uh, here, we're using regular CPD ALS and a regularized CPD ALS to recover uh, the factor matrices of a tensor where the factor matrices are ill-conditioned. So by ill-conditioned here, I mean that the columns of the factors are nearly collinear. So here you can see that when you use regularized ALS, you converge much faster um, than if you don't regularize. Okay, so we're using proximal regularization. So this is called the regularized ALS algorithm, and it's known to have the same stationary points as the original uh, CPD formulation in the deterministic case. And it helps avoid swamping because basically what you're doing is adding this proximal regularization makes each of these problems strongly convex. Okay, we also found empirically that proximal regularization mitigates the errors that are introduced by the randomness involved in sketching. So here we're plotting on the y-axis, the runtime ratio of various algorithms, and on the x-axis, the error ratio of various algorithms. And the red point in the middle there is when you're just doing CPD ALS, there's no regularization and there's no sketching. Uh, this green area, which looks blue, I don't know. Uh, this, the shaded area there is where your algorithm is doing better than ALS because its ratio of error to ALS is lower and it's faster. And those are the two things we want to get from sketching, right? Okay. So here's the meta algorithm that we're proposing to get convergence. So we're gonna use sketching in combination with the regularization. And it turns out the regularization is used in showing the conversion. So it's not just there to prevent swamping. It also helps show that we converge. Uh, is it necessary? I don't know. Um, but it helps. Okay, so the idea here is to just sketch the subproblems and use proximal regularization. Okay, so here's an outline of the convergence proof. Uh, to establish convergence, there's just three steps essentially. So the first is to, this is sort of the key point, is to show that each sketch least squares actually decreases the objective almost as much as a full least squares. So think of that constant CT prime is around one. It's slightly smaller than one, okay? So R times the projection onto M here is just saying you look at the residual in your approximation of the tensor at time T and you project it onto the Katri-Rao system matrix um, at time T. And that's sort of the error of your factors A, B, and C at time T. And the most you can decrease the error by updating A is by removing the projection of the error, which is the residual under the system matrix, okay? So you get almost as much of a decrease in your error as you would have gotten if you solved the actual least square system, okay? 
Uh, and this requires you to choose your sketching rate appropriately. It depends on the angle between the residual and the system matrix, because essentially you're trying to preserve the angle between them with sketching so that when you solve your sketch system, you get essentially the same minimizer. Okay, so that's the key point. And then the second step is that you can relate this decrease to the size of the gradient of the CPD objective. Okay, so unfortunately, yes, to prove convergence, we went from looking at the behavior of some second order method to like a first order method because we're relating it to the behavior of gradient descent. So there's probably something left on the floor here, but it allows us to show convergence at least. Okay, and then at that point, well, we have shown that we get what's called sufficient decrease and we're using proximal regularization so just standard sort of results in convex optimization tell us that we're going to converge to an approximate stationary point at a sublinear rate, okay? So now remember I said that this depends on you choosing your sketching rate appropriately. Well, appropriately means that your sketching rate basically has to increase over time. You have to look at larger and larger subsystems over time. So initially, your residual and your system matrix have a small angle. So even aggressive sketching is going to preserve that angle. But near convergence, of course, your residual has to be orthogonal to your system matrix. So preserving the angle is going to require more expensive sketching, right? Imagine you're solving a system whose solution is zero. If you slightly perturb it, the solution is going to be non-zero. Okay, so if the sketching rates are chosen appropriately, uh, this requires you to have some knowledge of the geometry of the system, which you don't. Uh, that's why this is a meta algorithm, not an algorithm. Then we get this guarantee that we're gonna visit an approximate stationary point. Okay. All right, so now we have the idea of sort of how to do this. The key point here is that the sketching rate needs to change over time, okay? Uh, so we're going to assume that we have a good regularization rate, like for the proximal regularization. That's a question in itself. Now, the question is, how do we sketch? Okay, so prior work suggests a bunch of different things. They all work well. They can be used, like they, they all will work with this sort of meta algorithm. But the question is, how many constraints should be sampled practically at each iteration? Okay, so the key observation here is that this is an iterative process. So as an SGD, when you're closer to convergence, you need to sample more constraints. Also, the performance of the sketching rate historically is probably going to be predictive of your future performance. So this suggests using an online approach to learn your sketching rates. Okay, so we allow the user to specify some set of sketching rates, and then over time, this algorithm will select the best performing sketching rate. And in particular, the, sketch, the user should also allow the sketching rate to be one so that you preserve the entire system. And that will guarantee that you will converge. Okay, and we, apply, we employ a label efficient multiplicative weight update algorithm. Uh, basically, the idea is that you're tracking the performance of each sketching rate over time. So we're explicitly saying that we're gonna measure the performance by how much the error of the approximation is decreased at each step and per time, okay? Uh, and then at each iteration, in principle, we'd like to update the loss for each of these arms, but it would be expensive to run CPD ALS for every single sketching rate. So we flip a coin and we sort of use that to amortize the update costs. Because if the coin comes up heads, then we update all of the arms. We run them all. If it comes up tails, we use the old information and we don't update any of these losses. Okay, so we choose our, our the bias on our coin to amortize the update costs. And then at every iteration, we're going to select the sketching rate I with probability proportional to its weights. Okay, so here's just some numerical results from this algorithm that we call CPDMW. MWU, multiplicative weights updates. Uh, here we were looking at a low rank approximation of a hyperspectral image. So I don't know if you can really see anything from these images, except that they look the same, 
right? So the first is the original image. The second is reconstructed using plain CPD ALS. The third is using our decomposition. They're effectively identical. And ours took approximately a third of the time of the CPD ALS. Okay, and then this is another example from the park bench video. Uh, so CPD MWU took 30% less time uh, and you can see the difference is basically zero. Uh, and then finally, here's some numbers, right? Uh, so this is from the park bench video and we're looking at the time and the error. And you can see that CPD MWU outperforms both ALS and sketched regularized ALS where we use sort of the best fixed sketching rate in hindsight, right? So we ran all of the optimization, we ran the optimization for these different sketching rates and we picked the one that resulted in the best result and compared that to CPD MWU, which is in an online fashion choosing the sketching rate. And we see that even accounting for the standard deviations, uh, CPD MWU is faster. Okay, so that's, you know, that's the takeaway from the talk is those two things. Uh, so now here are some interesting questions that are worth considering and that we're looking into. So one is there was this gap in going from or relating sort of the second order or second quasi Newton update to a gradient update. So can we show that at least local superlinear convergence is preserved when we're using sketching? Like that would be good. And then also we'd like to compare the performance of first order and these sketched sketch quasi-Newton methods. Uh, and then finally, um, well, not finally, because there's two more things, but the sort of problem that I'm looking at now is how can we effectively use sketching when the factors are structured? So, you know, they're sparse or they're positive. So uh, here you have some additional regularization uh, like L1 or, you know, the convex indicator for the positive orthant. So you add that to your objective. And then we want to understand how can we still effectively use the second order information when our problem is no longer like a quadratic. Okay. And then also, are there other approaches to hyperparameter selection? Because this current approach has some hyperparameters in it. Like, for instance, uh, what's your sort of bias on the coin? So anyhow, in general, I think that we have these tools for sketching. There's a lot of work that's been done on effectively sketching in tensor settings. And now I'd like to sort of prove that they preserve the convergence of a lot of different uh, tensor optimization algorithms. Uh, thank you. Um, have you considered any other banded algorithms or uh, are you just focusing on using this one to choose your sketching rate? No, I mean, I would love to consider other things. Um, I'm not a bandit person, so I use sort of the first thing that seemed applicable. Uh, I would be interested, you know, like a, a, a question, for instance, is instead of letting the user specify a finite number of sketching rates, can you do some sort of Lipschitz bandit type thing? But I don't know anything about that. So, you know, if someone here knows about that and you would like to collaborate, I'm happy to do that. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, you were had the runtime on uh, one of the prior slides. I was wondering if you could comment um, how much is the overhead of uh, sort of evaluating sort of the objective to re, re you know, change the sketch rate? Um, how much does that right. cost? Yeah. Yeah, so to update the weights on each of your sketching rates, you have to sketch the system and uh, compare it to solving the system without sketching. Wait, is it? Sorry, no, sorry. You sketch the system with whatever that rate is. There is a previous, you want that to go down. The measuring that and then you divide by the run time of that. Uh, so you have to do this for all of the arms. So it's going to be more expensive than either one, even one ALS sketch. I mean, one ALS solve, one full ALS solve, but the coin flip 
controls how often you need to update all of the arms. So you can amortize by like, you know, choosing your coin flip to be one over the number of arms. And that works well. Uh, if you look at the paper, you can, I think you can get up to like, I don't know, 50 different sketching rates before you sort of aren't updating the, the losses well enough to track the performance effectively. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering about the um, so the the one minus delta to the t that basically uh, in the guarantees. Oh yes, yeah, that's a union bound. Hopefully, you can do something better. Yes. Yeah, I, that was my question. I was wondering, is there a way to because even if it fails the guarantees, mm -hmm. maybe they don't fail too badly. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's like it's hard to mm -hmm. quantify fail a little bit, but not too much. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's a way to maybe? So Katjes Scheinberg has something that I think may be relevant here. Uh, like she's looking at stochastic, um, you call it trust region optimization. And they, I don't understand it, but they sort of allow you to just on average perform well, and then you can guarantee convergence. So, you know, if I understood that paper, maybe I would be able to adapt the techniques to here some martingale argument okay yeah. Cool. yeah i do think you should be able to do better than the union bound for sure and in practice obviously it is not as bad as this union bound implies Our next speaker is Eric Phipps from Sandia. Uh, so we'll be talking about streaming generalization. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Nick Johnson, who used to be at Sandia, is now at Cerebra Systems, and as well as Tammy Kolda, who I'm sure you all know, retired from Sandia a couple of years, maybe two, year and a half or so ago, and has her own company called MathSci.ai. Uh, so we're focusing on CP decompositions in this work, which everyone here knows about. I'll just This is just a summary slide. I'll just put up basically to remind you what the uh, uh, um, this button, what's the laser pointer button? Top one? There we go. Yeah, uh, the, the, the standard traditional CP decomposition solves this least squares problem as we've seen in prior talks, which is given by the sum of squares of differences between the tensor and the low rank model. And then in all the examples and pictures, we'll draw three dimensional tensors, but all of this generalizes to tensors of an arbitrary dimension. Uh, but we're not gonna focus on this particular form of CP. It's, it's been mentioned a few times, there's this generalized CP method that Tammy Kolda and others developed a few years ago, which uh, as Teresa just described, uh, you can derive that least squares optimization problem if you assume that the difference between your tensor and your low rank model is driven by Gaussian noise, which in many situations is not appropriate. Uh, so for example, for the count data case, you might use Poisson. Uh, so the GCP is a generalization of, of this problem to an arbitrary loss function F, uh, which may be derived by maximum likelihood estimation or may not. Um, but a sort of key uh, difference when you go to these other distributional assumptions is that the low rank model may no longer be directly approximating the tensor. It's in fact approximating the tensor valued parameter of the distribution that you assume your tensor follows. So for example, in the binary case, there's different choices of loss functions you use there, but in this case, we're using a loss function um, where you are approximating the odds ratio of observing a zero or one. So the values in the tensor are zero or one, but the low rank model can take any arbitrary uh, non-negative value. And so that, that'll have a important implication for how we do the streaming method for applying this kind of technique to uh, data that's observed over time. Okay, so uh, the challenge with this GCP method is that you lose in general the least square structure that underlies so many methods like CPALS so uh, Tammy and her collaborators pursued gr uh, gradient-based optimization to solve this uh, optimization problem. The gradient is fairly straightforward to write down. 
uh, with respect to the factor matrices, it involves this intermediate tensor Y, which is the gradient of the loss function element wise. And then you do MTT KRPs as would be expected. The problem is that in general, this tensor is dense, even if the original tensor was sparse. So if you have a really big sparse tensor, that means these MTT KRPs are going to be too expensive to compute. So instead, what they pursued was uh, stochastic gradient descent, where you randomly sample entries out of the gradient tensor every iteration, form a sparse tensor approximation, and then apply that in the MTT KRPs. Um, and then put inside a stochastic gradient descent algorithm like Adam, uh, which uses things like momentum to improve convergence and robustness. And they designed sampling strategies for sparse tensors, for example, sampling zeros and non-zeros uh, separately. And I'll just uh, reiterate something that has mentioned in a few talks that in, in sparse tensors, in, in this context, we're thinking about zeros as real zeros, that, that the data is actually zero, not missing data that you can ignore. So you really need to try and reconstruct those zeros as well as the non-zero. So you need to include them in the sampling algorithm. Okay, uh, so um, we're in this work, we're trying to develop a streaming version of the GCP approach where you have data that you're observing over time. Uh, there's a lot of work on streaming methods in matrix and tensor factorizations in the literature. And there's a lot of different formulations of those problems and corresponding algorithms. Uh, so we're going to make some assumptions on what streaming means in this context. And these assumptions are fairly typical, I think, in the streaming tensor decomposition world where you assume you get uh, you either observe or measure data in discrete batches, which you can index by time steps, T. You're gonna, we're going to assume that at every time step, you observe a complete DUA tensor, so there's no missing data. Uh, at every time step where D is the dimension of the tensor you're observing that it doesn't change over time, as well as the dimensions of the modes of that tensor are not changing over time. And as usual with CP, we're going to assume we have a fixed rank that we know what it is for our approximation, but we are going to allow the number of time steps to potentially be unbounded. So you would never be able to collect all of the data and then do a, a batch CP decomposition of that. It'd be uh, too big. Instead, what you need are algorithms that will incrementally update the, the CP decomposition as you uh, 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 observe new data. And so there's, there's several different works on, on streaming uh, CP methods in this context, and two in particular inspired this work. The first is the online SGD method, which uses gradient descent updates that are sort of similar to what GCP does in general. And then the CP stream method, uh, which is for Gaussian loss, but uh, has an approach for approximating old uh, slices of data that you observed in the past by using the uh, CP model from prior steps as essentially a surrogate, which we incorporated in this method. And I also wanted to mention this method called online CP, which we didn't really inspire our work, but if it's a very fast method that leverages the Gaussian structure and uh, works very well if you have that particular kind of problem. And we do make some comparisons to it. Okay, so for streaming, there's two equivalent ways to look at it. Uh, so for as a thought of experiment, imagine you are observing three-way tensors at every time step. Uh, and after uh, capital T time steps, uh, you have these uh, hyperslices of tensor data. You could concatenate those hyperslices onto a new mode, a fourth mode, which we call the temporal mode. Uh, and and then compute a CP decomposition of that at that point in time. And that would look something like the thing on the right here. Um, as and so, and so you have uh, four uh, factor matrices, A, B, C, and W. Uh, and sort of the key observations are as, as you add more and more slices in time, these A, B, and C factor matrices are essentially going to be fixed, but the the W factor matrix is going to be growing as the tensor is growing along this uh, temporal mode. So each row of a factor matrix of W corresponds to reconstructing some particular slice of the tensor data X. Uh, so uh, a, a given row of a factor matrix is just a set of R, capital R, where R is the rank, uh, values. So instead of thinking of doing the CP decomposition of this growing tensor, uh, with a growing uh, factor matrix corresponding to that mode, you could think of using those the row of the factor matrix as the weights of a of a CP decomposition of a time varying tensor. 
Uh, but again, the uh, factor matrices A, B, and C shouldn't be changing because they're trying to represent the, the decomposition over all time if you had the right factor matrices. So this is the way that we'll actually describe the algorithm and motivates some of the algorithmic uh, choices where you're trying to compute a CP decomposition of a time varying tensor with time varying weights, but fixed factor matrices. And so this is a one slide overview of the uh, optimization problem that we're gonna try and solve at each time step. Uh, so the first term is your standard GCP uh, uh, objective function for, for your choice of loss function, where you're trying to find the factor matrices A, B, and C and the time varying weights for that particular time step, given the time slice XT that you've observed. MT is the uh, just the low rank model at that point in time. Uh, but you can't just have that because A, B, and C are supposed to represent all of the tensor uh, data that you observed over all time. So the second term is a regularization term that tries to encapsulate that. The net effect of this term is to basically prevent A, B, and C changing too much from step to step. But the idea behind how that works is uh, you introduce a history window uh, which is the points in time in the past that you want to include in the optimization problem. That's a user defined choice. Uh, you, you can include all time in the past, or you could include the you know most recent n steps, or it just depends on what data you want to include. In the work that we did here, we actually used a technique called reservoir sampling, which is a way to uniformly sample over uh, your entire previous uh, set of uh, slices that you've observed with some fixed number of samples. Um, theta, this term theta t to the minus h is an exponential downweighting. So if theta is less than one, that will uh, ex exponentially downweight older and older data. So even if you included all time, eventually the weight would become zero and effectively truncates that. Okay, so given the time slices in your history window, wh is the time varying weights uh, from those prior slices that you observed. And so uh, this is basically a reconstruction of the uh, CP model at those uh, points in time using your current factor matrices that you want to compute at this step, A, B, and C. Whereas A bar, B bar, and C bar are the factor matrices from the prior time step. So the idea is that if you had a good approximation to those uh, points in time previously, uh, you could use that as a surrogate for those prior tensor slices. Um, and so this term here is basically a surrogate of, of those prior tensor slices, so you don't have to store them. And this is basic, this uh, Frobenius term here is just saying that those should match. And you might ask, why would you use Frobenius loss here when you might have, when you have some other loss function, if you have non-Gaussian data? And the reason is because of this issue with GCP that you're not directly approximating the tensor anymore. You're approximating the parameter distribution. So it, it's not a valid thing to do to take the reconstruction of your CP model and put that in as the first argument to your loss function. In general, they can have different weight, uh, different uh, units or different ranges of support, like I said, for the Bernoulli case. And initially we were using the loss here in this term and uh, we had a talented summer student Kyle Gilman point out that we were doing that incorrectly and it explained why this wasn't working in certain situations like Bernoulli. So we use Frobenius loss here, uh, like I described instead. And then you might include other regularization terms that are common in CP decomposition to impose uh, non-negativity or low rank and so, and so on. Uh, so that's the optimization problem we're gonna solve at each time step. Um, since the factor matrices uh, a, B, and C are assumed to be changing slowly. We're going to use a, a, a two-stage solution process that's common in the streaming CP world where every time step we are going to first freeze the factor matrices A, B, and C at their prior values, which zeroes out this term, and then just uh, try and minimize this objective function by just varying the weight W. Uh, the weights might change dramatically from step to step, but the uh, factor matrices assume to change slowly. So we'll just do a single solve with those separately. And we'll use this GCP stochastic gradient descent solver to do that, uh, just modified to solve for the weights, but keeping the factor matrices fixed. 
Then once that's done, uh, we'll then do another GCP solve where we just solve for the updated A, B, and C uh, with the weights fixed. And so we'll do that two-stage process every time step. And so there's a lot of parameters that go into deciding how to do that, uh, which I'll mention at the end. So this is just a quick overview. There's more details in this paper that uh, was recently published. Okay, uh, so this has been implemented in a tool called Gen 10 that I've been working on for many years now. This was a tool to initially, originally to implement GCP in an HPC oriented context, but has grown to include other kinds of CP decomposition methods, including the streaming method. Uh, it's designed for extreme scale architectures. It uh, is possible distributed and shared memory parallelism, runs on GPUs. It uses this tool called Cocos in order to facilitate that. And then it has both MATLAB and more recently Python front ends that allows you to use those tools as your sort of data analysis uh, workflow, but then call Gen 10's implementations for large scale data underneath the hood. Okay, so that's the tool we're going to use in some numerical experiments. The first is some synthetic data, uh, synthetically generated data where we take a, a low rank model uh, and then perturb it with noise and compute the tensor reconstruction from that and then see if we can reconstruct that um, original CP model uh, using both Gaussian and Poisson uh, noise. And uh, there's a couple of different ways we're measuring the accuracy of these methods. So we're comparing to different methods depending on what the uh, appropriate is appropriate for the choice of loss. Um, so one is how well do we reconstruct the original CP model or often, ca often called K tensor that was used to generate the, uh, the data. That's this K tensor score, which is the cosine simulator score that was mentioned previously, as well as looking at the loss uh, there's two ways to do that for the streaming methods. Uh, every time step, you have the loss that you get after solving for your factor matrices and time varying weights. That's called the local loss. Uh, the global loss, so, so those factor matrices change over time as you stream each slice. So the global loss is taking the final factor matrices that you have at the end and then back testing them against all of the prior data. Uh, sort of to see how well they really represent the entire set of streamed data. That's what we call the global loss. For the batch methods or static, whatever you want to call it, those are those two are the same. Um, but uh, sort of takeaway is that all of the methods are providing similar reconstructions and losses. Uh, the only real difference is this online SGD method that I mentioned. You can see the global loss is increasing as you go farther back in time, and that's because it doesn't have any kind of regularization term to prevent the factor matrices from changing too much from step to step. So that's synthetic data. We also have some real data of experiments. Um, these two are count data. The first is counts of taxi rides in New York City. And then the second one is counts of words in abstracts appearing in archive.org. Uh, which is a newer data set that we've looked at in, in this work. And there's some pretty cool factors that you can see in that, which I don't think I have time to go into, but if there's interest, I could show you those um, interesting patterns that CP shows. Uh, again, we generally see the losses of the two, uh, comparing the streaming GCP to the static GCP are similar, except for this big spike that occurs in archive. And that is because at that point in time, Archive reorganized many of their paper categories. They, for example, they split them up into subcategories. And so that represents uh, sort of a shift in the data where the, the factor matrices would then change to reflect that. And because we constrain the factor matrices from changing dramatically from step to step, it takes many time steps for the streaming method to sort of adjust to the new data. So this is an example of sort of non stationary behavior that you might observe in real data and can see how. Uh, if the time scale of that is appropriate, the streaming method can eventually adjust for it. And then the last case, uh, using a Bernoulli loss, it was mentioned previously, the Chicago crime data is appropriate for given where we're at. Uh, this is normally people use a uh, Poisson loss for this, but many or most of the entries that are non zero are just one. So instead, we just use Bernoulli loss for this case just to show using something other than Gaussian and Poisson. And again, we see similar. Uh, loss between the streaming and the and the uh, batch GCP methods. 
Uh, then just quick computational comparison. This is comparing the runtime of the streaming to the batch GCP methods on both CPUs and GPU architectures. So you want to compare the blue and orange bars. Those are both CPU for a given problem uh, to the uh, gray and yellow bars, which is our for GPUs. Uh, for the same problem. And you see generally the streaming method is faster, usually quite a bit faster because this is a log scale um, than the, the static GCP method when they're both using the same total number of samples. Okay, uh, to finish up, uh, we presented a new uh, streaming decomposition method for general statistical data types that provides accuracy that's comparable to the batch methods in an HPC software implementation with Gen 10. Uh, but there are several challenges. Like I mentioned, GCP in general has a lot of parameters that require tuning to get good performance out of it, uh, mostly because it converges slowly. Um, and so we have essentially two GCP solves for time steps. So we just essentially double the number of parameters that you have to tune. Uh, and there was some tuning that went into those results, but we tried not to tune them too heavily. Uh, but it, that those parameters do affect uh, runtime performance. So you do need to do some tuning. So one of the some of the work that we'd like to do going forward is to try and uh, make the al algorithm more robust to those kinds of uh, hyperparameters, so that you have don't have to do as much tuning, primarily by getting it to converge faster. Uh, we don't currently have uh, a distributed memory parallel implementation of the streaming method, nor do is it in, incorporated into the Python front end. Neither of those are challenging; just haven't had time to do it. So. Thank you. Which slide? And the model state where you displayed the model. So there are two parameters. The, uh, yeah, the this? third one, the next one, the next one. So uh, um, how do you uh, determine that T dot T minus H, like, is it a- Well, that's a user chosen thing. It would just like depend on what you think is important. Uh, if you really are most interested in newer data, you would set that to a smaller value. But if you want to really include everything, you could set that to one and it wouldn't downweight information. So it's just based off what you want to try and uh, get the streaming method to um, emphasize. Also in the CP method, we have a lambda parameter typically to decide on the weights of the every rank one tensor. Is there any correlation between that lambda parameter that comes in the CP model against the W parameter that have you? Well, yeah, so the, the W is essentially the lambda. W. So if you think of doing an unweighted GCP of the whole thing, the and then you look at, uh, that's what I was trying to describe here uh, if you do without lambda for this entire tensor data set, you can think of the rows of the W factor matrix as as the weights of a time varying uh, decomposition. Uh, if you had weights in this version of it, then they would just be multiplied by the W's of the of the temporal. If I understand broadly, like this is for slow changing, uh, yeah. slow temporally changing model, right? Like yeah. Uh, because that's the reason why even when you have factors separately for every time t against the global model, there are not much of the changes. Right. right. Okay. Yeah, and that's a pretty uniform assumption in in these methods. Uh, Um, did you use any regularization in the numerical experiments? You no. Uh, you're talking about uh, the last term here? Yeah. No, we didn't. I should have mentioned that. We turned that off for this problem. But it's included in the implementation, but we didn't use it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, I guess that would make sense the more non stationary your data is. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I guess if you know some, yeah, if you see stuff like that happening, you could turn it off and you can change that through the history window here as well, as well as the theta parameter, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Akon Anwarja. Did I tell that right? Yeah. About that. So his talk is about pre constraint optimization under uncertainty and his company time. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Abia Antil and uh, Sege Dolgov. Um, I I will promise you that uh, I'm not going to keep you so long because uh, lunch is almost here and uh, you're going to have your lunch very soon. Okay. Um, so I'll first of all give a little bit of introduction to uh, stochastic inverse problems and optimization and then talk about uh, risk averse optimization and how we, and then I move on to how we used tensor train approximation to solve this problem. And then I'll give some numerical examples. Okay, so um, so many problems in uh, scientific computing, um, engineering, they are modeled deterministically, but um, it's very reasonable most times to take into account uncertainties, especially when we do not know exactly the parameters in the model, uh, the, the value of the parameters in the model, instead of guessing the values. So it's good to model them, let's, let's say, as random variables. Uh, for example, if you have, um, if a certain process is uh, modeled using uh, PDEs, so like the coefficients or the right-hand side or even the geometry on which the, the, the PDE is posed can be modeled, uh, could be random. And then this leads to doing some uncertainty quantification uh, for, uh, for the PDE, random PDE. So what do we mean by that? So we mean, Given some inputs to the model, uh, we need to determine the statistical information about um, the outputs of the PDE. Uh, most times we are not interested in the solution of the random PDE, but we are interested in, let's say, the expected value, the variance or so of the solution. Okay, so why do we need this? In most cases, we, uh, we, we why do we need to do, do UQ? In most cases, because the data to, uh, the, it's difficult to measure, uh, the, the data we need are difficult to measure, and we also need to do some um, parameter identification, for instance. Okay, so uh, to motivate this talk, uh, let's look at this model. So let's say this is a PDE. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, this is this model uh, arises in a water, uh, groundwater flow modeling. So this is the pressure head, and this is the right-hand side. This is the conductivity coefficient. So X has a thing for the uh, special variable. Uh, so it's, there are so many standard ways of solving this. It's very easy. You can uh, discretize using finite element method or finite difference and so on, and then you can solve it pretty easy. Uh, but um, in some cases, we, we this is the fourth problem. The first one is the fourth problem. But what if we, uh, can observe the, the solution, you know, noisy solution. Uh, we have uh, noisy observations of the solution, but we want to like com compute the right-hand side uh, that gave rise to this solution, for instance. So we can uh, model this, uh, formulate this as a regularized optimization problem uh, like this, uh, subject to this PDE. So things get a little bit more uh, interesting if uh, the PDE actually, uh, has, uh, depends on uh, uh, some random variables. Uh, as I said before, for instance, the uh, conductivity coefficient here could, uh, since we do not know it, for instance, at all the special points, so what we do is that we consider it as a random variable for each as the, uh, special point. So then we, a collection of this will now form a random field. Okay, so in that case, we are now interested in solving a stochastic optimization problem. 
And the standard way is to, so the solution here, the Y, which is the solution of the PDE, is now stochastic. So uh, here the objective becomes stochastic itself as well. So we need to minimize the expected value of um, this objective. Okay, that's the standard way of doing this. But then, um, uh, minimizing the expected value of the of the of the cost can be very misleading, because uh, extreme values of the realizations of this solution can can be uh, we can have extreme realizations of this uh, solution. Why? And but they they are very rare, but they are very important. This is the case, for instance. Um, um, so. So in that case, doing the expect, using the computing the average of of this of this uh, of this objective is not is misleading. So the uh, an alternative way to do this is to use the so-called uh, risk measures that in, uh, that are given coherent risk measures that are given uh, for example like this. Uh, this one is called mean plus semi deviation. So Another one is conditional value at risk. We are going to focus on conditional value at risk. Conditional value at risk is, it's actually originated in finance uh, where they are used uh, mostly for uh, uh, quantitative risk modeling. Um, so this, this quantity actually takes into account the, those values that can be very, for instance, in great portfolio modeling. So uh, if you have a loan distri distri uh, loss distribution, then there are some losses that can be very catastrophic, but they have very small uh, probabilities. So, okay. So conditional value at risk, as I said, is given by this. Uh, so where beta actually is the confidence level, which, which could be like, for instance, 98% or so. Um, but it has a, it's convex, it has very nice properties, it's one of these coherent risk measures. But the problem with it is that um, there is this there is this uh, object here which is uh, which is not uh, differentiable here. So that is the problem with it. So um, uh, we call it relief function. Okay. So this is why it's difficult to you know optimize. So another problem with this kind of uh, problem is that. Uh, the coherent level uh, sorry, the conductivity coefficient could depend on several random variables. For instance, it could, D could be like 100, 1,000 or so. And then it's now difficult to compute the expected value of this random variable. And in, 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 so it, it, evaluating this expectation might be very, very difficult. So these are the two major challenges you know, associated with this. So using this, uh, uh, Coherent risk measures, uh, for instance, conditional value at risk, uh, leads to what we call risk averse optimization. Okay, so ah uh, yeah, so we are not the first to look at this kind of problem, but um some of the people that have looked at this um include some of the papers that looked at this include this and that. Uh, so is that so the right and his co-authors they actually used in zero point methods to deal with the non-smoothness of, of, of the relative function. So uh, Kuri and uh, Sandia National Lab, they used uh, dual methods to deal with this kind of problem. But the one we want to follow here is the smoother relu. So the idea is to replace the relu function by a function that is, um, that is infinitely differentiable, okay? So, how about the high dimensionality, uh, the cost of dimensionality problem? Um, so the standard way to do this, of course, is to do Monte Carlo. You see, the Monte Carlo, you know, for if you have so many samples, you know, it can be very slow. And so most of the papers, the papers we have seen up there, they are using Monte Carlo. So we are not using Monte Carlo. So this is where tensor product approximation comes in. That's what we are using. Okay. So we will focus on we will focus on smoother ReLU to deal with this non smoothness, and then we'll use a tensor product approximation TT approximation to deal with the cost of dimensionality with respect to the random variables. 
Um, we have said that this could also be tackled. The cost of dimensionality here could be tackled also using Gaussian processes or neural networks or even sparse grids. But we haven't seen this in the in the framework of uh, risk covers optimization. If you if you have seen this, please let me know. Okay. Okay, so the first step, as I said, is to replace the relief function by uh, infinitely differentiable function. We call this um, sub surplus function. So, which which is what we are, which is what we have here. So, as we can see from this plot, as uh, um, uh, epsilon tends to zero, you see that this this uh, function actually approaches uh, the the relief function here. So. So the idea is now to replace um, this function, the real function in the objective by this uh, uh, surplus function. And, so, and then we end up with this uh, optimization problem to solve. Okay, so how do we solve this? One way to do this uh, is to, of course we can do full, full Lagrangian formulation or we can also do reduced space formulation. But here in this talk, we are focusing on uh, review space formulation. So what, what does this mean? This means that, okay, uh, for review space formulation, first of all, we assume that there exists a unique solution to the constraints, the PDE. So once we solve this PDE for uh, Y, then we now plug it into the objective, and then we have this um, objective, which depends on the control U. Okay, so what this means is that we now have um, uh, uh, some computable expectation. So, uh, sorry, it implies that we now have both the gradient and the Hessian of the cost are comparable, are computable and continuous. Uh, the thing is here, how do we, uh, uh, what, 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 how do we approximate the expectation here? So we are gonna talk about that a little bit later and that is where, where we are using uh, TT approximation. Okay, so so if we now, plug, for the moment, let's just assume that that approximation does exist and then we have, have it here. And then, um, so the good thing here is that um, uh, in this case, the Hessian, uh, the Hessian in T is bounded away from zero. And yeah, we can now, we can now run, um, a Newton method with line search. So, so the idea is um, we initialize, first of all, we initialize the control, which is u, and the t, the variable t, and then we set the F, um, epsilon not to be the quantity, which we are going to discuss what this thing actually means. And then uh, we update the solution satisfying um, amigo conditions, and also for each iteration, this condition is also strictly um, satisfied. And then we decrease, in the next step, we decrease uh, epsilon uh, uh, based on this parameter, which lies between the number, and then we we'll continue. Okay. So the, so, so, so we can actually, uh, the Hessian is um, invariable in each iteration, and then we can also, um, observe quadratic convergence, especially by fixing this um, epsilon, you know, in the last equations. Um, as I said before, this can also be done. What we have seen, um, full space uh, Lagrangian formulation is possible, as I said before. But in this work, we didn't do, uh, we didn't consider that because it was more computationally expensive. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. So how do we deal with, so how do we, uh, what about the cost of dimensionality in this expectation uh, that we are talking about? So um, so let's consider a, a, the case where we have only two variable, uh, two random variables. So first of all, we introduce a Gaussian quadrature with nodes given by this and weights uh, given by that. And then we, we now uh, compute this matrix, which we are sampling from, from this uh, function, this uh, soft loss function, and then we have this expression here. Uh, so this is this matrix we can put in low rank format, 
um, which, so by representing it with these tall skinny matrices, instead of storing this big matrix. Okay, so uh, this rank, uh, we put it in low rank format, of course. Uh, so the, this rank uh, R is actually small. We have seen this several times in, in this talk, in, in this uh, workshop. So this rank is actually small compared to the size N of this, of this matrix. But the thing is, um, we can actually prove that indeed this is the case because uh, for, uh, for, for G being analytic, this is this is this actually is the case. Okay, so this quantity we have been talking about is then computed as this is is this expression here. Okay, so this only needs two n r uh, floating operations instead of n squared operations to solve. And the low rank approximation here can be obtained using um, singular validity composition. Okay, so how how about when we have higher number of random variables, let's say 10, 20, 30, and so on. So this is the case where we now consider tensor train approximation. Of course, this can be done you know, other, other ways. Okay, so the idea, the idea of tensor train approximation is to put uh, to that the, the G function is now, has this uh, approximation here. So these are called the TT cos, this universe, uh, Functions they are called the TT cos, and um, and then we discretize each of these uh, psyche uh, with n degrees of freedom, and then we have this representation. Each of them they are um, 3D tensors. Okay, so what, the idea of this uh, tensor train is that so each of them is connected by this. Um, we have these indices that are connecting each of them. It's like coaches in train a train, and then um, so each of them has this uh, uh, rank, and then we assume that the, we, we define TT rank as the number R that bounds all, all these uh, ranks of this uh, TT course. Okay, just like uh, what we saw before, then we can uh, express uh, the expectation, the approximation for this expectation we have been talking about uh, as follows. We have this representation, which is based on the, the quadrature weights and so on and so forth. And then this is now linear in in the okay so this actually tt approximation re relies on because i said my time <laughs> so relies on tt cross ad algorithm which is adaptive and uh, abraham's uh, talk uh, abraham's um, um poster yesterday explained most of this stuff because of my time i have to um, jo but just believe me this is very interesting it's very technical that is too okay so um, so we have this to, uh, this example. So we look at this uh, PDE here. So the idea, uh, the control is, we looked at the 1D and the 2D problems. So the control here um, is acting on this, and in, this uh, in this interval here for 1D and then it's acting on the circle. And the, so we do finite element uh, discretization of this problem. So um, we assume that the, uh, sorry, the conductivity coefficient you know, uh, can be expressed as a level expansion. And then uh, we have um, this size, uh, th th these random variables are the Gaussian. Okay, so our objective actually is of tracking type. So we want to minimize uh, the error between, between uh, the solution and this desired state, which is just a constant function one. Okay. Okay, so, just uh, how how did this perform? The algorithm perform. So we see uh, in the left hand panel, we see that the error is effectively linear in in the um, smoothing parameter epsilon, and and that um, it um, the error is also exponential in the quadrature number of quadrature points. And so, which is good news. But uh, we what is the price to pay? The TT ranks. We see the TT ranks out of uh, the smoothed indicator is actually proportional to one of our epsilon. And so we also looked at in, in the right-hand panel, uh, so this is the numerical complexity uh, is actually proportional to um, this error, one of the error. Okay, so uh, what is the major takeaway here? Because of my time. Uh, the major takeaway here is that um, functional uh, TT 
uh, uh, TT, uh, a tensor trend is um, a really efficient approximation format for smooth functions. Uh, uh, in most cases, they are exhibiting um, uh, exponential convergence. Um, these risk measures that we have looked at, especially this lever, uh, they are usually non-smooth, uh, but they are very interesting to use, but op optimizing them is very difficult, but using a smoother, which we have proposed, uh, at least then, um, um, makes it converge, makes our problem converge, you know, at least linearly. Um, actually, this this can also be improved using uh, multi-level Monte Carlo correction, which um, so the, most of the details are in the paper, uh, we, we, which is given here. All right, so that's it from me. Yes. Are you trying to penalize the tails? Yeah. More? So, so what the conditional uh, value at risk does is, so it comes, it looks into the tail of the distribution. It, it's so um, basically, it's the expected value of all the values uh, above the quantile, uh, the alpha quantile. Of the Have you tried using important sampling? So, no, 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 we didn't use it yet. Maybe you have to change the biasing distribution every iteration. I, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat>